is that? Uh, what class is that? That's an excellent question. <laughs> uh, you don't know your uh, your your schedule? I barely know it. I only have four classes, so you'd think I'd know it, but like, um, oh, that's that's such a light load. Yeah, well, that's also because my advisor quit halfway through. So, oh like, yeah, that, well, we Liverman, both had the same advisor. Yeah, so, so I was like, well, I still need that code, and he was like, no. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, peace. I'm, uh, I'm out. I'm no longer. You're no longer my problem. So I was like, okay. I literally just got assigned uh, Lang like two days. Yeah, ago. yeah. So like, it took forever because I had to. I reached out to um, Jack Banks. To Banks, yeah. And I was like, hey, uh, help, please. <laughs> <laughs> Please help me. So he's, I'm trying to sign up for, oh, what was it? Uh, film history and I want to take cinematography next semester. So like, I don't know what the, I don't know if there's a prereq for it, but. Um, as long, well, we I both, as long as you took like, 230, we both took that. That's right. the, I'm pretty sure that's just, that's the prereq. I was going to so. say, I think it's just like the, the filmmaking or production course, like the intro level. Yeah. Um, but yeah. My I, oh, back to your question. <laughs> um, my earliest class is my comms, uh, my communication in the digital age class. You're taking that? It's, yeah, I worked with uh, Susan Cardillo last semester okay. um, on one of her uh, internship sort of projects, where she kind of like takes you under her wing for credits, and you do like various projects across campus for people, and she'll give you credits. Which is okay, cool. I'm just curious because I'm pretty sure. That wouldn't be. Are you trying to sub that in for like a cinema requirement? No, no. Just taking. I it? just decided to take a comms class. I was okay, like, cool. Because um, I know networking is very important, especially in like film and like everything nowadays. So like, just kind of getting a better stance in communication plus anything. Oh no, wait, what was it? No, it actually might have been a pre uh, prereq for one of the classes I wanted to take. Um, mm, yeah, it. Can't for the life of me remember what the actual class was, but I'm pretty sure this class is a like one of the like intro level communications courses. So like once you take that, you can kind of branch out into the communication school. I can't right, remember. Okay. Um, there were a couple of classes. There was like I've been doing the intro to TV production. It was oh god, I honestly can't even tell you. I really can't. I'd have to look at the I'd have to look at the sign up lists again. My brain ain't working right now. <laughs> it's fried after one class on lunch. Go me. <laughs> uh, is it Friday yet? <laughs> oh, it's all, almost. It's almost. It's almost. So close. We're so close. Yeah. I got one class tomorrow, so that'll be fun. Hmm. But yeah. Um, actually, funnily enough, I'll have that class tomorrow and then I'm done. But then I have to uh, book it on over to the mall and fix whatever the hell happened to my phone. So yeah. Yeah. Having a blast. Let's go to the mall. <laughs> Take your canvas bags, take your canvas bags, <laughs> take your canvas bags to the supermarket. <laughs> Wait, which song? Are- oh, God. Because um, I was doing the one from How I Met Your Mother, Robin Sparkles. Oh, Let's go oh, to the mall. Oh, oh. I was, no, I was going, um, uh, you ever heard of the four chord song? Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the ones they threw in there. I honestly yeah. couldn't even tell which you. What, you mean one of just literally, literally 4,000 any, any kajillion song? songs that <laughs> exist with the exact same chord progression? Yeah. I'm going to see it chapter two tomorrow. I saw it uh, last weekend. Did you? How was it? I liked it. Liked it. I good as the first one. Not as good. It's definitely not as good as the first one. Gotcha. But I enjoyed it almost as much. Okay. Like to the point where I honestly didn't even mind the runtime. Yeah, that it's much. what it's like two hours and twenty six. I mean, minutes? sure, it's two hours fifty. Oh, it's fifty. Oh, two hours. Shit. Two hours fifty minutes. Right, right, right. Okay. And sure, it could use some trimming. But I honestly did not mind it all that much. Was that the only like drawback for you? Like, what didn't you? I mean, without mm. spoiling it, obviously. Like, um, just like plot wise, character wise, penny wise. I just took it as it as it was. Nothing. I'm just like, I'm just like, yeah, I'm watching this and I'm enjoying it. I not to the point where I I don't even really mind the runtime all that much or any of the um. Right. No longer movies nowadays is becoming a staple for like two and a half hour cinema mm-hmm. runtimes. I don't mind it. It's yeah, good. me neither. Cram a better story. I mean, unless it. it's, I mean, there are movies where you can really feel that three hours. Lord of the Rings, for example, or like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, that's pretty much. It. Was that was the Lord of the Rings was the first movie to really pad that runtime beyond like two hours, if I remember correctly, right? Or am I the first were like really big? Of like, yeah, the first like blockbuster three hour like runtime event. 
Uh, maybe. Or was that was that there might have been other was that ones. Braveheart? Did Braveheart come before or after Lord of the Rings? Braveheart was like ninety five. Oh, okay, so a little bit and that, same time ish. Yeah. yeah. Well, Lord of the Rings was oh, wait, released. It was late two thousands or early two thousands. Sorry. Lord of the Rings released two thousand one, two three. Right, 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 right. Okay. And Braveheart ninety five. Ninety. Oh, okay. I, I was mean, thinking there have yeah. been long fucking movies forever. Right. Right. Like um, nineteen twenty eight, Metropolis. That's fair. That's like three and a half or something. That's valid. Or or two and a half. Two and a half? I want to say two and a half. I think it's two and a half. But, you know, there's... Or I'm about to watch a movie in my European road movie class. That's three fucking hours long. It's right. from like 19... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's an old... It's great Ger- year. It's That's a, a great year. <laughs> great year for film. It's an old German <laughs> road movie. And it's, oh, you know, geez. it's three fucking hours. I mean, uh, uh, what was or it? Or like Cleopatra. Birth of a Nation, too, is what, like... Two and a half hours long. It might be, or like Cleopatra, yeah, from like nineteen forty like, something. Uh, it's like four, four. It's four hours and three minutes. Jesus, you, like, you need like a fucking that. intermission. <laughs> yeah, but yes. Even I can't even make it through uh, Return of the King without taking a break. Right, like, and it takes so it takes me four hours to watch a three hour twenty minute movie. See, that's funny because I got the director's box cut extended edition, so each movie is like yeah, exactly. It's, it starts out at like, oh, it's like a almost three hour movie, a little bit over three hours. And then you get the box cut. And it's like, OK, I guess I'll push the runtime to like three and a half, four hours. <laughs> I even have like the uh, extended editions mm-hmm. of Lord of Rings. I haven't watched them yet. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it'll take you fucking three years to watch it. I did the. Oh, my God. Dude, it takes. That's an entire weekend there. It's literally a 26 hour movie marathon. I know because I've done it. <laughs> I shit you not. I have actually watched all the Hobbit movies and all the Lord of the Rings movies extended cut start to finish without like, why would you do that to yourself? That's an excellent question. (laughs) I honestly don't know. (laughs) Oh God. No, it was, it was a lot of fun. Fun fact, like instead of, you know, going out and enjoying prom or my prom date after prom, I ended up going back to my buddy's house and we watched uh, fellowship, the ring because you know, that's what we do. Yeah. Just took a swig of, uh, swig of wa- water. Yeah. I wish it was Russian water, but unfortunately we can't all have what we want. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> For example, yeah. we don't have communism anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I liked it. Chapter two. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bringing it back full circle. <laughs> but um, yeah, I liked it. It's, um, nice. it's uh, first of all, casting. Mm. It's just, it's fucking there. Was it? Casting. Okay, good. And, That's one yeah. thing I was worried about. was like... I mean, some... At at points, there are some characters that are not giving much, given much to do. Right. But you know, just you got Jessica Chastain uh, as Be- as Bev, Bev right. Marsh, uh, James McAvoy. I was gonna say, how's he doing as he's, Bill? I I really like James McAvoy. That's fair. And you know, he's just he's just he's a great actor, and he I think he he does well as Bill. Cool. And then um, of course, Bill fucking hater. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> that was. Did you see there's a meme going around right now where it's like it's Bill Hader and um, Bill Skarsgård who's already in like full it clown makeup. Yeah. And it's like Bill Skarsgård was had two lazy eyes as a kid. Mm-hmm. And, and he so, can still float them apart, which uh, it freak Bill Hader yeah, the fuck out. I know it's just the funniest photo ever. <laughs> it's so funny. But there are moments with Bill. Hader. OK, let's let's just face it. It's the Bill Hader show. It, it, chapter two is the Bill Hader show. Is it? Okay. It is. And uh, this, I'm pretty sure this is not spoiling. But um, when uh, Isaiah Mustafa playing Mike, who stayed behind in Derry, the black kid, he's, you know, it comes back and he has to call everyone. Right. When he calls Bill Hader, Bill Hader as Richie, he's grown up to be a stand up comedian. Oh, that's funny. And he's about to go on stage. Oh, you Gets the be. call from Mike. Hey, it's back. It's back. Right. Um, walks out the back door, barfs over the stairwell. Are you Jesus Christ? And it's a really, it's a cool kind of crane shot, like going up the uh, this the the uh, the, the the fire escapes in the, in between buildings. Right. To it's he almost barfs on the camera. That's so <laughs> funny. I can't wait to see it. My buddies and I, we actually sat down and watched um, the first part on Tuesday night. Um, and we're like, oh, we all can't wait and. Um, I don't know how big into like the hardcore rock metal genre you are, but there's an album 
that just got released by uh, Ice Nine Kills. Mm-hmm. Don't know if you're familiar with the band. Um, and it's called The Silver Scream. It's, um, how many songs is it? I want to say it's like 13 songs. Okay. And each song is written about a classic horror movie. So, like, the first okay. song is called American Nightmare. It's Nightmare on Elm Street. The second mm-hmm. one is Cursed Crystal Lake, obviously, Friday the 13th. And then Stabbing in the Dark, Halloween, and goes on and on and on. And the last song is about it. It's called It Is the End. Mm-hmm. It is such a good song. Like, it's even for people that, like, aren't of the, like, the hardcore, screamy metal genre. Like, right. I understand it's not for everyone. I It took me forever to really build up, like, an actual tolerance or, like, to enjoy that sort of music but god let me tell you like the way they are able to like put the absolute essence of each of those movies into each of those songs is so good like for example the um the very beginning of curse of crystal lake which is the the friday the 13th song starts off and it's got all the um it's got a like a fire a campside fire Mm -hmm. or camp fireside um ambiance going and it starts out with a bunch of kids singing the the chorus with a gu- with an elect- uh, wow an acoustic guitar, all sitting around a campfire. And then it like breaks down hardcore, and it's so good. Uh, there's one for uh, jigs, uh, one for the Saw movies. Mm-hmm. You can, they actually take parts of the soundtracks of each of these movies and they incorporate it into the actual songs themselves. I'm actually going to see them live in November. Uh, they're coming up to um, the Palladium up in Worcester cool so that'll be dope i'm gonna go dressed as the crow from the crow <laughs> wild <laughs> um, one of the songs is uh, a grave mistake which is about the crow they um you've seen i'm assuming you've seen the movie i've seen bits of it i haven't seen it in full yet that's definitely one you want to check out um as much as it is like a darker movie it's definitely like a cult classic mm-hmm. and honestly probably one of the best movies of all time in my personal opinion but I'm not like a classist. Like I don't go back and watch like ancient movies and I don't go back and I like, I very much try and stick to the times with the exceptions of like late seventies, eighties and nineties. That movie in particular is, it's really good. And the main, the, this isn't spoiling. The uh, protagonist is a guitarist in a band Mm -hmm. and he plays a solo at some point during the movie and they actually incorporate parts of that solo into the guitar solo in the song. Cool. So it's a nice smooth transition and it's, it's just really well executed. The entire album is so good. And uh, who is this? Ice nine kills. Ice nine kills. Uh, Okay. Like I said, it's a, it's a bit of a heavier, it's a heavier listen. Um, just because of the genre itself. Cause they're like, I don't know what the exact sub, uh, sub genre of metal it is, but, Metalcore? No, I wouldn't say it pushes that far because it's definitely got like chord progression and it's definitely got like melody and melodic hardcore. I honestly would even, yeah, I would say that's a little bit closer because like it's not just straight screaming for like 13 songs. Like the guy can actually sing. Right. So, which is always a nice break. In fact, a couple of the songs he doesn't, he doesn't scream at all. For example, Grave Mistake, he doesn't scream at all. Mm hmm. And then he did one for American Werewolf in London. Okay. Mm-hmm. With uh, Chelsea, uh, Chelsea Bridges, the actress, I think. I don't remember if that's her name, but um, he does a duet with her as the two parts of American Werewolf in London. Really good album. Nice. Yeah. I mean, I listen to heavy stuff mm-hmm. sometimes, although it's more, it's not, it's very much not metal, but it's okay. as close as you can get to metal. Without like, actually being metal. Kind of. Cause like, you mean an example? I would say like my favorite kind of heavy rock band is Soundgarden. Okay, I got you. Or like Nine Inch Nails. Oh, okay, so you're talking like grunge, goth rock, that sort of feeling. Not quite, because well, the only kind of goth rock I listen to is The Cure, and that's not quite heavy. That's you, fair. You know, like my favorite grunge band is Soundgarden. That's and fair. To the point where even. Like I have a friend of mine who says like the heaviest I ever go he he ever goes is like Queens of the Stone Age. Even though he does like his own fair share of grunge, he's like, nah, Soundgarden, me. 
I love Soundgarden just because I love Chris Cornell. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll absolutely agree with you on the grunge form there. I would argue that Nine Inch Nails is definitely more of like, I mean, he was really the only, because it was for the most part just one guy, Nine Inch Nails. I don't yeah, remember. Trent Reznor. Yeah. I don't even know what I label him as because it's not like it's, electronic. I, would, well, I mean, I would call it industrial. It's like gothic industrial. It's I mean, it's a unique sound and it's really good. Yeah. My favorite record there is like down the downward spiral. That one's good. Yep. And but that's the second record. Mm-hmm. Have you listened to the first record? Uh which one is this? It's called Pretty Hate Machine. Pretty Hate I'm sure I have it downloaded. I don't know if I've listened to it in its entirety. Pretty Hate Machine from nineteen eighty nine. Okay. It's got like hit like a hole. Oh, wait, okay. I thought that was no. Was that pre I thought Am I inventing this album, Movements? Is that... Movement? That's no. a New Order album. I was going to say, that's not the right... That's not. Okay, well, yeah, then I know that I know that album then because, like, I listen to... So it's got, it's got like, Head Like a Hole, um, yeah. Down In It, yep. um, Something I Can Never Have. Yeah. St- I really like, like the album Closer because it's, like, it takes the song closer and then it, like, really breaks down each of the individual... Oh, melodies. that's the, um... That was the, uh, like, this Closer... St- Remix EP yeah. kind of. It was really good. I yeah. enjoyed it. But um, when when you look at Nine Inch Nails in the big picture, it's um like you look at that first album, Pretty Hate Machine. Mm-hmm. You can think of it almost like a synth pop record, but okay. with distorted guitars. Interesting. Hmm. I'll have to. Yeah, I'll have. To, I mean, I didn't really dive too deep into them. Like, I know a couple of songs are like had like a hole closer, and you um, can even hear that kind of. Left over and like the song closer. Because yeah. it, when you listen to the downward spiral, it, it just like with the first few tracks, it's like, yeah, this is very much like rough, industrial, right. distorted guitar kind of sounds. And then you listen to closer, it still it has that like synth kind of um it's it feels kinda uh gritty. what's the word? Not gritty. It's the um I'm not sure how to describe it. It's the it's that synth sound that um it's kinda whoop. Oh, oh, uh, it's, I don't know. How would you describe that? Cause it just, it just, uh, what's the word for it? It sounds the way it oh, sounds. God. It reminds me of like the, the, ele- these, the electronic bits of pre hate machine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't think of the exact. Tone. Just kind of what? what yeah. What? Like phaser almost. Yeah. Yeah. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah. I can see that. Like I said, I have to delve a little bit more deeply into it. Um, I just kind of recently got back into Nine Inch Nails. Yeah. I'd even throw Rob Zombie in that same sort of genre, though he's a little bit more on the metal side and less on the grunge yeah. side. Yeah. For someone who tries to listen as much music as they can, mm-hmm. you would think I'd be more into metal. But the thing is, I don't know, when I listen to, I don't know, like Sabbath or mm-hmm. Zeppelin, it just doesn't hit me as like like other music does which is weird considering like i'm such a big fan of soundgarden right and their bread and butter is very much zeppelin sabbath i was gonna say it's you literally put those two bands so what about it doesn't really hit you do you can you put your finger on it i think the best explanation i've heard is from um do you know who john bryan is i've heard the name john bryan is just like um, musician, multi instrumentalist, producer, and film composer. He worked with Paul Thomas Anderson a lot, unlike Magnolia, okay. um, Punch Drunk Love. He's scored a bunch of other movies like Eternal Sunshine and Spotless Mind. Oh, okay. Recent Lady Bird. Okay. I Heart Huckabees, directed by David O. Russell. Interesting. He co produced um, Kanye West's uh, Late Registration. Really? He produced there's a lot of stuff for other people like Amy Mann. Um, he did a Punch Brothers record. Interesting. He uh, he released his own solo record in two two thousand one. There was just an interview with John Bryan, where he said he was trying to distinguish between songs and performance pieces. Okay. Because when you think about it, songs are chord change, melody, lyric. Yep. That's what songs are. But most people nowadays, we've grown up in an age of recording. And so we tend to conflate the ideas of recordings and songs into one. Okay. He goes to a piano. He's like, this is a 
melody to a Led Zeppelin song. It's just like, right. and I'm like, and I could play like 30 others, and that's what they are. Right. He's not disparaging Led Zeppelin. He still loves those records. Right, right, right. But it's something about the way those recordings were made, the legacy they have. It's because that was just like a certain point in time with this certain drummer, with this certain guitarist, with all these particular people who got into a room and and played music. Right. That's what those quote unquote songs were. Okay. He plays stuff like um Lithium by Nirvana on a piano mm-hmm. as a chord melody piece. Gotcha. And you can instantly recognize like that's such a cool chord change. The melody is just really there. It's gotcha. real catchy. You can recognize it immediately. That's what songs are. For me it's it's because I'm looking I'm trying to look for the song behind the the soundscape presented to me in a record. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, so you're looking for a little bit more to do with like the chords and the filling rather than like a strict melody. Is that what I'm? No, it's getting? um to me. I no, oh, of course I'm brought up in a very Western okay uh, way of looking at music, being that we're in the West, mm-hmm. and the thing that matters is melody. Right. The most like that's the top thing. It's the top line. Right. Okay. No and so that's why when we want songs to be really popular or successful, the thing we worry about most is melody. Right. A catchy, you know? unique melody. It has to be catchy. You have to be able to hum it. It has to be to, to stick in people's ears. Right. Right. And when I'm listening to a song that I, I presume it's a song, I am, I'm looking for melody. Okay. And, and, that's, and then after that, I'm looking for some interesting kind of harmonic play to it. Gotcha. So like ACDC... As much as I appreciate ACDC, um, they're very straight. It's pretty much the, the same, same chord. Songs, it's the same, same song. Chord, yep. It's the same chords, and uh, Bon Scott or Brian Johnson screaming a different lyric over it. That's fair. That's and so definitely fair. It doesn't. Again, that's not to disparage ACDC. Oh, absolutely. But when you're writing, when you're trying to write popular song, and like as a as a song, as the we knew it in like the twenties or something, gotcha, or the thirties. You are looking for a melody, some kind of chord progression that you might want to. You could stick to like just bare bones kind of triads and very diatonic, but then Cole Porter and like Rogers and Hammerstein, you're like, we want to spice it up, right? And then of course lyric because that's the melody and the lyrics. If you marry them in a way that that works, it's um, it's, it's a, unbeatable. That, that is a song there, right? That's what that's a song that's gonna stick in people's heads. Right. Yeah, I understand that. Um I I will actually hundred percent agree with that. For example, like um I totally get like A C D C um Green Day, Nickelback, Zeppelin, Sabbath, a lot of those bands all suffer from the same thing where it's like, yes, they have a sound, but that sound just gets reused and reused by that band and it's not really all that dynamic. Well, I mean, you could say, I wouldn't say suffer. They suffer from it. But, like, in the case of Zeppelin, they were trying to, they had the sound. Right. But they still had their little bits of experimentation, like with Stairway to Heaven. Right. Or, like... Going to California. Going to California. But, like, if you look at the first record, it's pretty much, like, taking blue standards and cranking their amps. Right. You know? No, yeah, I I totally understand that. Um, Green Day is notorious for... A lot of their songs sounding very similar, and Nickelback obviously gets trashed on all the time for mm-hmm. their songs sounding identical. And they found a formula, and oftentimes yeah. you can't argue with a formula because it, it works. works. That's what a formula does. It sells, so like, it sells their records, which is exactly so. Like it's a delicate balance of having enough experimentation whilst also keeping not alienating your audience. Exactly. So I remember, like, um, um, for example, my, Zach Brown, real quick before you go yeah. off. Um, they started out very country, very Southern rock. Mm-hmm. And recently they've done stuff like um, Beautiful Drug, uh, which is like very four chords, like late 2000s pop. Mm-hmm. And they've done rock. They actually did a song with Chris Cornell called Heavy as the Head. Yeah. They've done Mango they've, Tree. And they had an EP produced by Dave Grohl. Exactly. Their, uh, uh, their album Jekyll and Hyde. It was literally an album full of experimentation. It went from island music to reggae to pop to 
grunge rock to jazz. They had literally everything in there, which was interesting. And now they're getting a lot of flack for like, oh, this band started off so good and now they sound like crap. My dad and I, we both love the new album. I mean, or they're one of their newer albums. They just put out a new album. I can't for the life of me remember what it's called, but like he follows them a lot more closely than I do. But I, I mean, I'm not one for country. I'm not a big country guy, but Zach Brown brings enough. I don't want to say musical talent, but, um, brings enough uniqueness to the traditional country sound that I can really start to appreciate the musicianship behind it because they are incredible musicians. I don't know if you... There was one time I saw Zach Brown backed by the Foo Fighters Mm -hmm. playing War Pigs by Sabbath. Yep. They've done War Pigs. They did... Oh, what else did they do? Um, They've done... They do a lot of live performances where they just take like classic rock songs and they go off and it sounds so good. Yeah. I remember back when... I heard an interview with Paul McCartney okay. about how, okay, so when the Beatles started, they were very much just writing pop songs. Mm-hmm. It was them, you know, just writing pop songs because, hey, dude, we live in Liverpool. We have no money. Right. At some point during their career, it became about the art. Right. They just didn't want to bore themselves. Like, uh, the thing Paul did was when they were about to, like, go into the studio and make a new record, he would listen to the last one to remind themselves himself where, where they were at. Right. Like, where do we go from here? What's, gotcha. what, what is there to do next? Again, they didn't want to bore themselves. So he, he was like, after writing, I want to hold your hand and uh, I'll follow the sun and like a hard day's night. Mm-hmm. There was, what, what is there to do next? He's like, what if I wrote a song about old, old ladies <laughs> in, a, in a church? And she's dead. Or like, what if I wrote about Paul was the one who came up with the idea of the Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Right. Because he wanted them, he wanted to be able to have license to, for them to do something completely out of the box. Right. He's like, how do we do that without like losing our entire audience? Yeah. He's like, well, what if we came up with this fictional band at that point? I'm not Paul anymore. You're not John. You're not Ringo. Right. You're not George. We we can do literally anything because we've had we have this facade of a fictional band to hide behind. And you're like, now I'm gonna write fucking Mr. Kite. Right. Or uh, all, all the other crazy shit that's on the album. <laughs> you know? That's fair. Um Or if you look at like the White album, that has like such a mishmash of Back in the USSR, there's like mm-hmm. a Beach Boy send up. Right. Or um, like a lot of acoustic y, like Blackbird or Julia. Right. And then there's like Obla Di, Obla Da, that's like fake reggae. Right. And then Good Night, the last track with that Ringo sings on, is like a whole Disney orchestral. Right. Whatever. Uh, like the really like bluesy kind of hard rock of while my guitar gently weeps. I love that song. It's you know? so good. Or. That song Piggies that George wrote, mm-hmm, that's like a that kind of, I'm not sure how to describe it. I don't really think there is a way to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> or That song's out there. Yeah. Or like um, that Wild Honey Pie Paul did. Oh, yeah. Honey Pie. Like, what the hell is that? Right. Just a minute of going, Honey Pie. Right. I mean, that was the whole thing with bands, especially back in like the early to, well, I'd say in the 60s in general, like. For example, the monkeys, mm-hmm. they were literally cast like a movie. I mean, the monkeys that everybody knows, they were not musicians. I, I'm sure you know about this, but they were one of the producers was like, all right, well, we got to get popular and we have to do it fast. So let's follow the exact template that the Beatles laid out. So let's get four guys with this haircut that look this style mm-hmm. um, and Name make them, them after, musicians. A, after an animal. Or- right. Right. So, you know, they ended up not writing any of their material until like 10 years into Most their Most of their career. material was written by Neil Diamond. Exactly. <laughs> which is the funny part. Um, so, like, that's always one I bring up when people are like, oh, sell out bands. I was like, monkeys didn't even exist. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, they didn't exist as an artistic entity. No, they did not. <laughs> but you also have to think there's so much going on in the 60s because everything exploded onto the scene. For example, you have everything from like 
the Beatles, you got the Rolling Stones that came out late sixties, and then you have the stuff, Who, the Who, and British like, Invasion, yeah, it's huge. Crosby, Stills and Nash, which I'm always going to vouch for because hello, um, <laughs> their music was like it was a very unique blend of like country and folk and like southern rock. It's like I'm assuming you've listened to Crosby, Stills and Nash, yeah, sure, yeah, um, and sometimes young. Crosby, Stills, Nash, and no, sometimes we young. don't. <laughs> we don't speak of that one here. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> you don't. You don't like Neil Young? No, 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 not with not with them. Absolutely not. But his solo stuff. Uh, some of his solo stuff is good. Um, I'm trying to think of what's the name of the damn song. Sometimes a man needs a maid. Yeah, that one's that one's a good song. Yeah, but like, don't touch Crosby, Stills, and Nash. <laughs> I'm sorry. No. I actually missed uh, David Crosby. He came up and he did a couple of shows in Connecticut and Massachusetts. It was uh, David Crosby and Friends, and I missed it, and I was mm. so upset because, you know, it's David Crosby, and he's ancient. I mean, you have yeah. to think about it. They literally, they played, they're old enough to have played at both Woodstock and Live Aid. Yeah. That's, how many bands can say that? You really have to stop and think about how many bands can say they played at both Woodstock and Live Aid. Santana? Played at both yeah. Woodstock and Live Aid. Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Sent, um, Woodstock, Live Aid. I can't think of any other bands that did both or that maintained the same sort of pull over three decades to have yeah. a billboard name on both of those concerts. Because 60s Woodstock, 69 Woodstock, that was all psychedelic. That was all like really really classic rock laid back hippie music flower power the whole nine yards live aid in 85 that was like peak of 80s music i mean brian adams played i mean the who played queen for christ's sake like to think of the, the change in dynamic from woodstock to live aid and then to stop and think wow carlos santana and crosby stills and nash maintained enough popularity and following and originality to perform at both concerts i don't know that's something i always bring up when people are like oh crosby stills and nash is just like a country band from like the 70s i wouldn't even I'm call like, them country they're not they're, that's why i say it. i just think of them as a folk rock band yeah that's what they are they're very they take inspiration like like zach brown does from mm -hmm. various forms of like that sort of calmed down music because they've got southern rock they've got influences of country a lot of folk music uh, wooden ships kind of goes off into like that island music sort of feel. I'd say a little bit. Some of their stuff, their album "Daylight Again," that song in particular, and their song "Tracks in the Dust." It's just so it's haunting almost, and it's you can really get a good sense of how they feel. Their music is kind of fading out and dying over the generations. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm trying to remember when, when those songs came out. But for example, um, Tracks in the Dust, you've been watching TV too much and all that hippie hopefulness is just a crutch. But if thinking that way helps you make it through the night, then who am I to tell you what's wrong and right? Like that sort of, oh, hippies don't exist anymore. Just go do you and we're going to live with the rest of the world sort of feel. And it's just, it's so beautiful. It's one of my favorite songs by them. I'd say those two songs and then Teach Your Children Well. Helplessly Hoping is really good too. Mm -hmm. To the Last Whale is always a classic. I'd say I personally love their haunting like hippie message songs a lot more than I like their happy go lucky like Judy Sweet Blue Eyes, Marrakesh Express, that sort of feel where they're kind of like yeah. a little bit more bubbly, happy, bouncy, that sort of thing. Yeah, I don't know. I think the deeper the musicians get into their own personal beliefs and songs always results in better music or almost always results in better um, music. Almost. Almost always. I would say sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> With talented musicians, it usually results in better music. <laughs> <laughs> Examples not to look at are, no. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, um, no, there's some, I mean, I fancy myself a songwriter and I feel like, say, putting like a political message in a song of mine doesn't feel right. You have to be very political about being political in music. <laughs> or if you do it, I would say you have to, I would, I would want to be real subtle. Right. You know what I mean? 
there's a concept album out there, one of my favorite albums of all time, actually, um, by the band Queensryche. It's called Operation Mind Crime from 1988. Um, and it it really dives deep into the heart of like political and religious um, uh, corruption in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of their albums are really well put together. There's a couple out there that aren't, aren't that good. For example, like they did an Operation Mind Crime 2, which is <clears throat> any album that is like the second part of like an album they put out years ago is never good. For example, um, Metallica with their reload or the unforgiven Two, like those albums just didn't hit right. And Queensryche is guilty of doing the same thing with operation mind crime. Too. You already have, you already have enough. It's already a challenge to follow up like a good record. Exactly. But to but try then and you want the to story, sequelize it. Right. That, uh, I mean, they like, tried, it didn't work. It, it was terrible, but I mean, you know, you could have gone like the Green Day route where so, like they put on American Idiot and it's like, yeah, that's great. But then like, oh, let's do another rock opera. Right. It was probably a good idea to not do American Idiot Part 2. Yes, I agree. For one, like that story was told, it was complete, mm-hmm. whatever. I, I happen to like the neck, the other record, um, 21st Century Breakdown. I love it. It has its flaws, but you know, I, I just, I listen to it. I think it's, I think it's good. I think and, it's very uh, musical. If there is a story, uh, I think it is there. But I'm, in the end, I'm, I think I I'm just... I struggle to really come up with a story for the album, but I like... I'm just listening to it for the tracks. Mm. I mean, in the end, I'm just like, yeah, there, I, I like. I happen to like the tracks. Right. There are so many people who like really shit on it because for, for one, like they don't like Green Day or something like that. But Everybody's got their preference. I mean, I don't, even if they're I mean, I don't like anything after after that album, but... <laughs> yeah, I'll agree with that. Revolution Radio had like one or two okay songs, but... My my. Have little you heard that they um they're making another record? Are they? It's coming out in February. Oh no! And they put out the lead single, and it's very not good. Oh no! Oh, here we go. My, actually, I did see that because they just announced a tour for it. Um, it's called Father of All Motherfuckers. Yeah, yeah. That'll be fun. That <laughs> that'll be an interesting uh, interesting ride. My younger I'm not going to go on that ride. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to have to because my younger brother loves Green Day and he's getting my dad to buy tickets to take him. To I got off at the stop at 2009. So Yeah, <laughs> I stopped listening to really any music post like 2010. So it's there's here there's spots here and there like some of the new event, um, Avenged Sevenfold um, or like... I prevail or set it off. Some of the newer, like I'd say emo metal, but like not because that's not technically a genre. You know what I mean? Like uh, kind of it's, it's, I don't want to say screamo either. Cause again, that's not like an actual, but that sort of feeling that I think you're looking for metal core. I think that's metal core. Metalcore still has such a vast meaning because it can either be like no melody and screaming and gent for like four minutes straight, or it can be like melodic and meaningful, but still includes great. I don't know. It's weird. I would not, I wouldn't go so far as labeling it metalcore. I would just call it metal, like modern metal. Yeah. Yeah. It's got there's some good stuff out, but like for the most part, I don't really listen to new stuff. It's all old stuff that I listen to, or like new stuff with like hints of old stuff. For example, there's an album, or not an album, a song from In This Moment, uh, featuring Rob Halford. Really? Mm-hmm. And the song is called Black Wedding, and the chorus is based off of White Wedding by Billy Idol. Hmm. So like it's the chorus goes. It's a nice night for a black wedding. And it's really good. It's like an inverse. It's a good counterbalance to White Wedding, but it's like a hard metal. And they actually list Billy Idol as the primary songwriter, which is really cool. Okay. So it's again, it's not like a heavy screaming. Like it's actually one of the few songs. I wouldn't say few songs. It's one of the songs that isn't like heavy screaming. It's got some good like melodic influences in there good stuff yeah so like again like new stuff with hints of the oldies like billy idol and 
Rob Halford. Do you mean that song. for every genre you listen to? Like you don't listen to anything past 2010 ever, ever? Oh, it's not that I don't listen to anything ever. There are, like I said, there's spots here and there of stuff that I'll find that I enjoy. For the most part, I tend to shy away from the new stuff. And I've really been digging deeper into like some of the more hidden and lost music of like the 80s in particular. For example, stuff like Dangerous Toys that nobody knows about anymore or like soundtracks from old movies. For example, The Lost Boys soundtrack. It's got some really weird stuff on it. Cry Little Sister. It's a really good song. Marilyn Manson did a cover of it. What would you say you're listening to that's post-2010 that's not like metal? Post-2010 that's not metal. Um, well, like I said, some of the newer Zach Brown albums, definitely. Yeah. Um there's pop songs here and there that I'll enjoy, but for the most part, I'll look for like acoustic versions or like acoustic covers instead of like the original versions. For example, um, Without Me by Halsey. There's a piano cover by, oh, I can't even remember his name. It's a remix and it, it's really good, but I can't for the life of me remember who it's by. Because um, a lot of the new pop songs have a, beautiful ideas and beautiful melodies but like they sound so much better acoustic i would i personally think like if you were to take any number of like pop songs like halsey or ariana grande and like kind of remix them into like acoustic or piano covers for example like avril lavigne's new album she's still doing stuff Mm -hmm. she just put out a new album it's actually really good it's very mature uh okay it really it it (laughs) the plot thickens no it's look i (laughs) say that that track that first song i fell in love with the devil off of her new album that's a good example of like new stuff that isn't metal look i'm not okay so not to disparage avril levine it might sound like it though oh go ahead yeah (laughs) i don't know there's just i don't love her music but like there's some songs in there that i really enjoy so go right ahead oh no just there's just there's something about the kind of Skater boy, best damn thing kind of sound. Right. The punk I'm, I'm just like, I I don't think I ever feel the need to ever hear that. It's like and the neo pop punk sort of like yeah, bubblegum punk weird thing. It, yeah. yeah. That's kind That's of how it I would say is bubblegum <laughs> uh, bubble punk. Yeah. And, it, and I'm just like, this is not, this will never be essential listening for me. No. I'd rather, I don't think I'll, I don't, I don't think, even if they do go through some kind of significant artistic mm-hmm. change, I don't think I will ever need to hear oh don't get me wrong i don't need to listen to it (laughs) it's not like oh my god ever living dropped a new album i need to listen to it go 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 no it's like i totally understand like i can hear the maturity that she went through which is really nice her voice definitely matured she matured as a person her lyrics matured yeah she stopped marrying guys after dating them for a month (laughs) chad kroger excuse me oh sorry (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and who was the other guy? Woo, like, I was the lead know. singer from Simple Plan or something? Oh, God. I don't even <laughs> want to think about it. I can't even remember his name. But, like, there's here and there, there's sprinklings of things. Like, I'd say that's a, a good example. I wouldn't say that's, like, a prime example. I'm trying to think because, like, I, ha- I literally have, like, probably 19,000 songs downloaded on my devices at any given time. So I'm trying to think of, like, anything that's come up. For example, like, I can tell you that the most recent albums I've downloaded are Ravage, which is an old 80s metal thrash band, and Fleetwood Mac. Like, those are some of the most recent albums I've downloaded. Now, are you talking about early blues rock Fleetwood Mac or mid-70s when Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham came in pop Fleetwood Mac? Both. Which one? Yes. What was the most recent Fleetwood Mac album? You got. Oh God. Um oh the one I the most recent one I just downloaded was um Crystal Visions, the Stevie Nicks collection. Okay. Which kind of encompasses the whole thing. But there's a version of uh Rhiannon mm-hmm. from Boston in two thousand five. It is beautiful. It's like a piano intro and it's just her and then it like kicks off. I thought you said from Boston. I'm like Boston covered it with her? Yes. <laughs> Yes. The, I would pay to hear that, honestly. <laughs> that would be a really interesting combination, Boston and Fleetwood Mac. Uh, I'm not, well, for one, I'm not a big fan of Boston or any of the ones named nice. after uh, cities. Yeah, that's fair. I mean. Oh, no, it sounds so stadium rock. I so, love stadium rock. So, uh, I mean, sure, there's some that I listen to, but it, they're, but it, it sounds so stadium rock, if you know what I mean. I would definitely agree with that. Um, 
fun little side note um, or anecdote. My mom actually went to the drummer's house at some point. Like they were doing tours to his house and they had like a wall of like gold records, which is pretty cool. I never met him. She never met him. And the house was not in Boston. No, unfortunately. (laughs) (laughs) Whatever. In terms of modern music that I listen to that's kind of not in that metal genre, I can do some of the like more subtle rock. For example, like Coldplay, I keep up with like. Um, Wait, you keep up with Coldplay? Uh, Coldplay and Muse, yeah. Muse, oh, no. especially with um, their uh, elim- oh, Elimination Theory. No, I. Well, for one, I don't keep up with Muse. Their their new album, I think it's a. Or at least not theory. since the Resistance. That's fair. It's. Their their newest album is like very eighties inspired. It think well, like the I like, remember I listened to a bit of drones. Okay, okay, and I felt really kind of really cock rock. Okay, so I was like, I guess I can I guess I can hear. I that mean, a it was bit. it was produced by Mutt Lang. I mean, that's definitely fair. And I liked the, up until the resistance, and then the second law came out. I'm like, I mean, I guess I okay, but then. Sooner or later, that just faded in my memory. I'm like, that was, yeah, that wasn't as, it wasn't good enough to stick with me. And then, Fair the, and then drones came out. Yeah, this, no. It kind of tapered off no, for you. No, it was just like, no, I just, no, this is not good. Well, like I said, their new album it kind of takes like a, a wild left turn out of nowhere because like it's still definitely Muse, but they, have you, did you ever watch the movie Tron Legacy? Yeah. Think like that soundtrack, like Daft Punk soundtrack music mixed with Muse. Like that '80s inspired, like I don't like what I just heard in my head. No, well, okay. No, well, <laughs> think like the Stranger Thing, the Stranger Things soundtrack. I uh, I don't know. No, okay. It's got that. It's definitely got like that sort of. I mean, you don't have to sell music to me, feel. but you just. I mean, because I'm already sold on the Resistance and before, right? But right. it's just again, it's the thing about changing so much that you alienate your audience. I agree. I, I agree. It's actually funny. I'm talking about this album whilst on a podcast because my show, The Shadow Realm, half the time we actually use that album as like background music. That Muse album? Yeah. Oh. We just kind of play it in the background because it's just, it like goes for a little bit and it's like not crazy interrupting and like, yeah. it's got like that sort of, I just can't think if, of words. If I were it. the DJ in, in a scenario like that, I would usually put on like jazz or classical music. Yeah, that's fair, but. For the Shadow Realm, just because it's usually like very modern pop culture. Or if it's like, oh, wait, no, never mind. I was going to say like put on ambient music. I was going to say like we should start putting on like D&D music, like dramatic campaign music. No, like um, Brian Eno kind of ambient. Oh, okay. It's just. um, Yeah, I got you. Like slow piano that Hmm. morphs a little bit. But in the end, it's just like there to be background noise. Right, right. But uh, I have the same problem with. Coldplay. Okay. Actually, I kind of fell off the Muse and Coldplay trains like at the same time. Really? Because, you know, I love Coldplay, but only up until 2010. 2011 is when they put out that album Milo Zyloto that had like yeah. Paradise and a yeah. Princess of China with Rihanna on it. Yeah. And I, I can understand that. I guess the singles are okay. And Paradise is the one standout track that I actually really like. Paradise is great. But then the rest of it. I hear they're like Brian Eno had like a rather deep involvement in it. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, we're, I thought you were going to make it sound good. And <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. Taking shots. Jesus. And then, no, that's fair. And then the, re- the every record since then is like, the, it, it suffers. It definitely suffers. Guy for the stars. I'm going to give you my heart. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? That's fair. I mean, I like some of their newer songs. Like, I actually enjoy Sky Full of Stars just because it's like, I don't know. I mean, it's... uh, it's Of course, I also like M83, so like, (laughs) so I probably should stop talking. I guess it's fine for what it is, (laughs) but like, even, they were trying to like, uh, work with David Bowie before he died, and then they showed him a song. He's like, well, it's not a very good song, is it? Hmm, that's fair. Yeah, when David Bowie tells you it's not a good song, maybe you should take that to heart. Yeah, <laughs> or like just saying. This kind of, it, there was, I mean, there was a there's a part of Coldplay. My favorite Coldplay record is X and Y, the third album from '05. It's just like you know because they started out as a very 
at their essence, they're very much like a guitar rock kind of band. Oh yeah. Uh, although absolutely. you do hear like hints the, of the, the electronicism, the, the, the fair number of like piano ballads, like right. the scientists and stuff. Mm-hmm. But in the end, like especially on X and Y, it's very much guitar rock. They're right. very much like they're one of the biggest inspirations is Radiohead mm-hmm. and at least '90s Radiohead. And you know, it's they're, they're they're good tracks. Chris Martin, I think, has a great ear for melody, and the lyrics are not bad they're not terrible i mean in the end they're kind of like you could say the he endlessly examines his feelings or whatever but like they're, they're fine songs yeah and then at some point it became very the sound the production and the lyrics went a direction where they were like it's like they were produced by avici all the time right you know what i mean yeah i got you him for the weekend it's <laughs> jesus <laughs> christ is yeah, the, is the adventure yeah. of a lifetime. Oh God, that's definitely. I definitely agree with that. It gets very floaty. It's like floaty and poppy, and it kind of loses that yeah. grunge, that rock. Well, I won't, not yeah. grunge, and, obviously. And then but Chris that, Martin was even like on an Avicii song, or right? Like a chain smoker song, mm-hmm. and I'm like, yeah, this, yeah for, for one, not. fuck the chain smokers. Yeah, and no, absolutely not. And, <laughs> And that song they, they did with Chris Martin is just, uh, yeah. No, thank you. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's, yeah. There was this video on the internet of a mm-hmm. guy who um is like, how every Chainsmoker song is written. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, he's, no. I have to just, watch this video. He's just like, okay, so take a chord and just like move up and down one scale degree. That's it. Just those three chords. They're right, they're right next to each other diatonically. Right. And just, dun, 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 dun. Do, 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 do. That's like that's the rhythm you need, and then just write songs about like being white and in love, and <laughs> being a teen, rich white teenager <laughs> who's in love. <laughs> oh my god! Okay, I really need to watch this video. <laughs> oh god, who's this by? Do you know? Do you I don't. Know I can't remember by? his name. I think he deleted his channel. Oh no! But like, but there were some people who like ripped his video and just put it up on oh, theirs or whatever. Okay, but. <laughs> He has others for like Nickelback. Uh, of course he does. And like uh, uh, the, the Hal- Halsey. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to check out this whole this whole thing. That's that's fantastic. That's really funny actually. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as much as I enjoy the uniqueness of Halsey's voice, it kind of gets on my nerves. <laughs> I've never heard a Halsey song. So... I doubt that. I've never consciously heard a Halsey song. Consciously, okay. Probably, it's probably been like playing in the grocery store. Oh, I guarantee then, it. And then I, I guess I hear it, sort of. Like the, Tell me how it feels sitting up there, feeling so high, but you found a way to hold me. I haven't heard that one. No. Okay. No. <laughs> that's, what, that's without me. That's one of her go-tos. Okay. Um, she was also on a song uh, recently, um, uh, East Side, with... Um, it's a duo between her and some other modern pop artists. Nope. They're good songs in theory, but like, again, it's just every, I hate pop nowadays. It's the same song over and over again. And like, and Halsey's not, not pop. Good. Is Halsey not pop? Oh, she is. She's, yeah, she's definitely pop. She's like a sad version of Ariana Grande. Okay. Sad is in depression. Sad, not like pathetic. Sad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I hate most of Ariana Grande's music just because, like, there's no enunciation in any music nowadays. <laughs> there's not. It's one <laughs> giant vowel movement. It's terrible. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like, <laughs> They just like, getting in trouble. Yes, like literally constant. Like you can't understand, and it's not even just the girls too. Like there, it's really bad. With Everyone's guys. trying to be Michael Stipe from earlier. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And all the guys are like trying to sing like Ed Sheeran speaks, which is just not a good idea. <laughs> What? You can't understand what he says to begin with. Stop trying to sing like him. <laughs> it's like, oh, God. No, people are trying to, like, be British in the way they sing instead of, like... Oh, okay. Because, like, you know, like, British Invasion, like, actual British Invasion um, artists, 
when they sing, it's hard to tell if they're British. Yeah, because if you're singing like, like in the most conventional way, mm-hmm. you get a neutral accent. Right, because you, if you enunciate... If Unless you, you're well, Damon enunciate. Albarn from Blur. Well, that's the thing. If you enunciate correctly, um, it's got to sound the same. Yeah. There is no enunciation in modern music at all. Uh, but like, great example, Iron Maiden, like Bruce Dickinson, it's very hard to tell that he's British in the way he sings. But his, as soon as he stopped talk, as soon as he stops singing and starts talking, he's like, "Hey, how you doing tonight?" It's like <laughs> that was terrible. Yeah. We're gonna ignore that. But like, <laughs> you're right. It's like it's painfully obvious that he's British. Yeah. But that's only when he's talking. This is what not to do. If your bird shits on you, that's literally how he begins one of his songs. Like. <laughs> Um, I I can't do British accents for shit, or at least not a Bruce Dickinson one. But you get my point. Yeah. Like, if you know how to sing, you don't sound like a nineteen-year-old British singer songwriter that doesn't know how to sing. Unless you're Damon Albarn. <laughs> <laughs> Unless, of course, you are. Yeah, but like, yeah, oh, God, <laughs> no, it's it's painful. That's why I don't listen to a lot of modern music. That's why I always look for like covers yeah. or like acoustic versions or like alternate renditions because it's just so bad. Do you like Blur? I haven't listened enough to really give a fair take. I really like um, the album Park Life from '94. Okay, which is even though Gallagher said it, it's like Southern England personified. Oh Lord, it's just. You, London call it no, no, yes. no but the, like the title track from Park Life has, uh, what's his name, Phil Daniels, who's a British actor person. Okay, and he's just saying the most his his parts are spoken word. Oh, okay. and they're just the most British things ever. Mm, wonderful, that sounds like fun. No, but like the whole idea behind Blur, it's like. Like when you listen, when you when you think about the Oasis versus Blur kind of thing in the nineties, yeah, it's very much yeah. Oasis is like the working class guys who just put out like rock, right? But then Blur is like the guys who went to art school and like putting out weird kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I get that. And in, and in the case of Blur, it's very much it's not it's very flippant. Most of them are <laughs> Such not a like great really word not like serious sincere kind of song right, right they're just girls who do boys who do girls who are boys who do girls right it's like congratulations yeah <laughs> oh god no I, I i understand that yeah like i said i really need to like actually go through and listen to it again <sighs> that's what i get for staying up until 1 a.m watching endgame go me <laughs> again <laughs> listen <laughs> yeah no my buddy we were gonna try and put it on we're taking a left turn for a hot second um we're supposed to start a movie night at like 8 p.m right yeah. we're like okay we'll put it off like 20 minutes because people think you're gonna be late 9 30 rolls around no and we've been trying to get the movie to play for like an hour oh. because like connection doesn't exist for anything in the village mm-hmm. so we had like 10 people 15 people in there were like just chatting away and then the movie finally starts at like 9 40 mm-hmm. so we don't get done until literally like quarter of one so it's like it's fine <laughs> it's totally fine <laughs> and then i had to get up well ten fifty isn't all that early well for if you, you're but. gonna watch a movie that that long i feel like you'd start you would want to start earlier no well, we tried starting at eight <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing is we had that same idea we tried starting at eight and then it didn't work <laughs> So, it was, oh, God, like literally if we had started on time, if we had started at eight, we would have been done by 11. Yeah. It's a three hour and four minute movie. It's not that long. <laughs> I think it's, it's three hours and like a minute or two. No, three hours and 42 seconds. Three hours, three minutes and 42 seconds. Is there, are you adding in like whatever? Or is this, is, this is the theatrical. theatrical oh, this is with cut. the, oh, I'm sorry. This is with um the intro. What do you mean the intro? Uh, the special like Marvel intro. So I guess it's oh, okay. to, like, yeah, I guess it's like three minutes. Or, wow. Three, <sighs> three hours and a couple minutes. So somewhere in there, either way, we would have been done around 11. And here I was at 1240. <laughs> but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> so, you know, back to the whole music bit. I don't know. I don't know. We're just 
trying to bring it back to the music. <laughs> no, we don't have to bring it back to anything. Okay, cool. Well, in fact, we're, I mean, we got on for a while. We can stop now. Oh, well, I'm game. Whatever you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, cool. Go watch Endgame, guys. Yes, do it. And it too. Even if you don't like it, like Benson. Okay. Good night.